Well, welcome back to another episode of Fig and Farm at Home. I am so glad you're here, and I really wanted to enter by saying woo-wee, so I'm just going to do it now. You are in for a real treat today because so many of you are desiring the same end goal. You want a home that feels a certain way. Whatever that that word is that you insert there, it is a feeling that you're creating for your space. You want it to feel a certain way and you want it to look a little bit more elevated than where you're starting. Sometimes the words I hear are cohesive, put together, not janky. And one client in particular said, not stupid. I hope that you're desiring a home that does not look stupid. (laughs) That's the goal, right? We want it to feel whatever feeling. I've heard lots of things. I've heard playful, fun, cozy, warm, inviting feeling of just being wrapped in a hug. You want your home to be that respite from the world outside. You want your home to welcome you when you come home from a long day of work or a long day of school. And you want it to be someplace that inspires you so that you can go and give your best out into the world beyond. We all want the same thing, or that's what I believe. But sometimes we are living with barriers to the thing that we want the most for our home. There are barriers, physical barriers, that keep us from having that home that we just love being in, that home that makes us feel super comfortable, that home that we are proud to invite our friends over to. There are barriers to that, and that's what we're talking about today. We're going to address three that I think are the most common and ways that you can remediate them. So stick around, and you might want to grab a notebook, get cozy, and grab a cup of tea and enjoy today's show. We grew up with the phrase, home is where the heart is, but our culture has shifted, and now the message is, home should be Pinterest perfect. I'm calling BS on that message. Home. It's not about the stuff, it's about the story. And whether you know it or not, your home is a reflection of you and is already saying something. So what is it that you want it to say? Hey, I'm Danny, a former first grade teacher turned home decorator. Going from a dual income to a single income so I could stay home with my babies meant budget, like ramen eating, Goodwill shopping budget. And I learned a few things along the way, like how to bring big style to your home without breaking the bank. And I'm sharing it all with you. Tips, tricks, decor, and design advice so you can learn to tell your story with your style. Where you can start living free from the Pinterest perfect trap and start living a life of intention. Welcome to Fig and Farm at Home, where we design happy living and where it doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. Barriers to creating a cohesive looking home. I have three. And chances are you might have one or more of them living within the four walls. Are you ready? Are you trying to guess right now? Are you looking around and wondering, hmm, what is a barrier in my home that is causing me to have a cohesive looking home? I can think of a couple in my own home. Yes, even me, a home decorator, because I keep telling my clients that I'm talking to recently, I don't know where the money tree is. So if you know where that is, (laughs) let me know. Or show me how to plant one in my backyard. Until then, there are parameters that we need to place. There are priorities we need to have when it comes to your own home. And one barrier to mine is a rug. Yep, it's happening to me too. And I think I mentioned this rug before. It's a rug I had in my dining room. I know that is hit or miss for some of you. A yay or a nay, a big fat no or a big fat yes, that you like dining room rugs. But we had one. And I'm not necessarily sure that it complements my personal design aesthetic. Do you wonder what yours is? I bet you do. And if you don't, there is a way that you can learn. We're going to talk about that as we address one of the three barriers to to creating that cohesive looking home. Okay, before I keep going down the rabbit hole, telling you all the ways even I have barriers, let's talk about what they can be. The first barrier to creating a home that feels put together, that flows seamlessly room to room, that feels cohesive. The first barrier is a bully. Nobody likes a bully. Nobody. Maybe the bully themselves, but nobody likes a bully. And a bully, if if repetition is the key to great design, repetition is the key to creating a cohesive looking home, bully 
is the antithesis. Bully is the foil. Bully is the opposite. We don't want to have any bullies. Bullies bring us down. And so what do I mean by that? When you have a bully in your home, you have something that just doesn't, it doesn't quite work. It doesn't quite belong. It sticks out maybe like a sore thumb. Sometimes bullies do stick out like a sore thumb and sometimes bullies are a little bit more subtle, like the rug in my library. That rug that used to be in my dining room now is in the library. That rug is quite honestly a bully and it's a super subtle bully. If you walked into my home, you probably would think this is a lovely room. You would probably think, wow, this looks inviting and warm and cozy and I just want to curl up and read a book. But what I see is the recognition that something doesn't quite fit. Something doesn't quite belong. Something was mispurchased quite honestly. And now it's a waiting game until that money tree grows. (laughs) But what do you do about a bully? How do you recognize a bully? And what do you do about it? Bullies can be anything from big things to little things. They can be anything that defines a design aesthetic using an adjective. It can be too big, too small, too orange, too white, too round, too square. Bullies can literally be anything. So three ways you can remediate a bully in your space. They're going to be the three R's, actually. The first thing we're going to do is recognize that you have a bully. How do you do that? How do you do that if you've been living in this space and you think, oh, I think it's fine? A lot of times when we are taking a peek at our room, we want to take a step back. Take a step back and enjoy the view. When I'm down at my shop, my little brick and mortar shop, oftentimes I am in the throes of uh, restocking items, fiddling around, making it look pretty and shoppable. I'm merchandising. I'm not necessarily decorating. I'm merchandising, creating multifaceted displays so that it is appealing to the shopper. But when I am so close and my nose is literally touching the pillow or so close it could touch the pillow, I'm too close to see what doesn't quite make it, what doesn't quite work. So what do I do? I take three steps back. I get a different vantage point. I get a different view and I take it in in a different angle. And then I take a picture. And when I take a picture, oftentimes what I see through the lens, I actually don't like. I encourage you to recognize your bully by taking a picture. For you, I encourage you to step back, get out of the room that you're in, get to the widest angle you possibly can be and look into that space and take a picture. What do you see? What do you notice when you pull up that picture on your phone or on your camera or on your computer? What do you notice? Can you see anything that doesn't quite belong? Like that game that we played when we were little. I wanna sing that song, what is that song? One of these things is not like the other, that one. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things, we might have loved it. We might have picked it up on our latest trip to Italy. We might have gotten it from grandma. We might have gotten it from the thrift store and it was $1 and we couldn't pass it up. However we acquired it doesn't really matter. The thing that matters is that you're recognizing the thing that doesn't quite fit with the others. That's the first step to recognizing and remediating a bully. The second thing to do is to remove it. If that piece that you got on your last trip to Italy was lovely, it was a great reminder of your trip, but it just now you notice it sticks out like a sore thumb in your space, remove it. Removing it doesn't mean throwing it away. Removing it doesn't mean giving it to your best friend. Removing doesn't mean packaging it up in a nice little box and a nice little bow and giving it as a white elephant gift to your Christmas party. It doesn't mean that. It means maybe it could. (laughs) That can be kind of fun. But it can mean to just putting it in a different place in your home that makes more sense. It could mean leaving it there because you love it so much that now you're going to remediate And that's the third R. And what I mean by remediate is you are going to think about the design element of that bully. What is it? Is it a color, a shape, a wood tone, a metal, a pattern? What is it? And can you remediate it by bringing in a few other things of like design element to add the repetition? Remember, repetition is, repeat after me, the key to design. It really is. 
repetition, repetition, repetition. We can say it over and over until we're blue in the face. Repetition is the key to great design. And if you love that piece that you got from Italy, but it doesn't make sense, it is just screaming at you, I don't belong here. You can, you can remediate it by bringing in other things of similar style in order to make sense there. Otherwise, it's going to keep on hanging out like a big bully that it is. The second barrier to creating a cohesive looking home is bondage. Did I tell you that these are all starting with B's? The three B's. It is bondage. Something is keeping you stuck, quite literally. And by something, I don't mean budget. I don't mean a partner who has opposing views. I mean an anchor piece that is keeping you stuck. Remember, anchor pieces are those things in our homes that are either built in or they are too costly to replace every once in a while. They're too costly, so you don't want to necessarily spend more money to replace it. You can't do it yet because you just bought it, but now you are stuck. You are in bondage to this thing. And when you're in bondage to whatever anchor piece is holding you back, sometimes we then make the choice to make all future design decisions based on the thing we are stuck with rather than working with it to our advantage. Now, if you are scratching your head saying, what on earth is she talking about? Let me give you a couple examples. I know that anchor pieces that are too costly to replace every couple years are couches, tables. I know that they are um, sometimes armchairs, coffee tables. Everyone's anchor piece is going to be different based on your financial situation. I know for me, I have a couple armchairs that don't cost a whole lot. They just don't. I took a, a chance on them on Wayfair. They're amazing chairs. I absolutely love them. My cats love them. They are now their chairs. <laughs> They're in great shape. They're holding up well. I didn't take a big risk on them and they didn't cost a lot. So those are not anchor pieces. Those fall into my peripheral piece category. But my couch, my couch costs a couple thousand dollars. My couch cannot be replaced. I cannot find in my budget, every whenever I get the whim to change my couch, I can't replace it. So that is an anchor piece. Do you see what I'm saying? So some of us are bound by a couch, and this is where I see it quite often. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple examples of the, the most common anchor pieces that bind. The first one is a couch. The couch that you found on sale at Costco. It was too good of a deal to pass up. And guess what? You brought it home and now you're stuck because that couch is way too big. Or that color that you thought was okay in Costco, you weren't making a plan around, but it was a great deal. And so you brought it home and now that color doesn't work with what you already have going on in your home. Or Oops, you got it home and it's too small. It's too overstuffed. It's too brown. It's too something that doesn't quite work. You don't like it anymore. You moved and moving expenses don't allow you to add the budget to get a new couch. Whatever it is, why ever it is that you are bound by this anchor piece of the couch, it is oftentimes a sore spot for so many. Another one are baseboards, wood trim, millwork, we'll say. Sometimes it is the flooring. Sometimes it is the cabinetry, the oak cabinetry, the, oh no, I can't paint wood mindset. That is keeping you stuck. And a lot of times, instead of creating a home that we really enjoy we make we position our rationale to be something where we're going to make all future design decisions to bow down to this thing we actually hate, this thing we actually can't stand. And if you come to think about it, even if you think I am only going to be here for about five more years, let's do some quick math. Five years times 365 days in a year is 1,825. That's 1,825 days you'll be waking up to a space that you are bound to. You don't love it, but you're bound to it. And that's a lot of days. That's a lot of time. If we break that down further, that's 43,800 hours you are in your space, not loving it. Your homes should be a reflection of you. They are an opportunity for telling your family's story. They don't have to be perfect, but they should be 
a place that you enjoy being. So if every time you go to your oak cabinet, you open it and you think, oh, I hate this. I really wish, I really wish, but I really wish, but that's an awfully long time to be stuck in that place of I can make change, but I just feel stuck by it. And of course, there are times too when that anchor piece is built in, like the oak cabinets, where you know that you want the change to be something dramatic and bold and big and tearing down walls or cabinets and replacing. And that might not necessarily be a realistic option, but maybe painting them is. And I know some of you right now are gasping and saying, but Danny, no, do not do that. And I may never ever convince those of you who love wood to paint over it. I may never convince you. But some of you who are sitting on the fence saying, well, but maybe I could, maybe I should. Another option could be to get the cabinet doors uh, replaced. Maybe donate them to a store like Habitat Restore where they can repurpose them, reuse them, someone can use them and get new ones made so that you're only painting over the base. I don't know, just an option. The point here is it is an awful lot of time to spend in a place where you are bound by something big, something stuck to the wall or something too costly to replace. Okay, so I'm telling you all the bad news. What do you do about it? How do you fix it? How do you move forward out of that cloud of gloom I just presented and put a little ray of sunshine into it? Here's how. We have the three E's to combat the barrier of bondage. The first one is expectations. Managing your expectations of what is possible to remediate on your own. For example, I know that flooring can be an anchor piece. I know that flooring is a foundation for your home's design, but I also know that your walls are a foundation for your home's design. I know too that right now it is just not possible to raise whatever ungodly amount it costs to replace your carpeting. I know that's not feasible. So what are some options instead? Managing those expectations and instead of saying, I'm going to wait for that someday, I'm going to wait for that windfall, I'm going to wait for that big thing. If you manage your expectations and think, bring it down just a bit, I can't do that. What can I do? I can't do option A. What other options could there be? Sometimes, for example, in this flooring option, I know that if I make one change in one of the foundations of my home, walls or floors, I'm going to dramatically change the appearance of my whole space. So if I can't change the flooring, I bet I can change the walls and I bet I can change the walls for maybe under $500. I'm managing my expectations because even though that flooring is the first thing that's going to go when I get that windfall someday, I'm managing my expectations to the thing that I can do, the change that I can manage. The second E is to engage. Engage with the idea of what it is you can do, similarly to managing your expectations, how big or little you can make the modifications, but engage with what it is that you have, the options you have available, and your own personal style. That's a lot. It's a lot to engage with. But here's what I mean. Let's say you're stuck by that oversized chocolate covered couch. And we used we used chocolate couches last week. So that poor chocolate couch. <laughs> I'm picking on you, but you can be very lovely. What can we do if we sit with the couch for a little bit? What changes can we make that will flow into our own design style? that will flow seamlessly throughout the room that require us not changing out the couch. Kind of like we talked about last week. If you didn't listen, go back and listen. We talked about um, seasonal decorating. And we used the idea of this chocolate couch that maybe looks great with, with fall colors and fall decorating, but once you start adding in Christmas colors and Christmas decorating, it can, something doesn't quite look right. And it's the combination of colors, generally. So what do you do to remediate that? You change the combination of colors. That's something that's manageable. It's something that is that we are able to 
remediate rather easily because those are our peripheral pieces. I know that if chocolate is the thing, the design element that is keeping me stuck, if I am just so over the chocolate couch, but I know that I'm saving my pennies, but it's still going to be two years until I can get the new couch, that's okay. What can what changes can you make now? And can you shop the house to make them so that you're not you're not overspending the money that could be going towards the savings for a new couch? Think small. Engage with, sit with what it is you have, what it is that you can manage right now in order to make those changes and in order to make it work. The third E is is energy, quite honestly. And this is a little tricky because it takes so much energy to stop yourself from making really quick, hasty decisions and so much energy to make a plan, to make a plan that actually works. So if I am in, back to that poor brown couch, if I am in the position of wanting to, knowing that I am ready to replace it, I've got the budget um, started. I'm putting aside a little bit every month in order to make it someday in the next decade where I can purchase that new ch- that new couch. Right now is the time to invest your energy towards making a plan so that you don't repeat that same mistake, so that you don't get sidetracked by this idea that there is a sale at Ashley Furniture and you found the first couch that you you sat in and you enjoyed. So that you are not bound again by making the purchase first and then having to plan around the purchase. Making the plan first and having that end goal is really critical to creating a space that works for you, that flows room to room, that looks cohesive, that feels warm and cozy. Creating a plan and then working your way backwards to know which step you need to make first and then second and then third and then fourth and then so on until you can buy the couch. Oftentimes when I'm working with a client, one of the things I I love doing and I surprise them often with, you don't have to have a big budget right now to get started. You just don't. Tell me what your starting point is. Is it 500? Awesome. 500, we can do a lot with 500 because so many of the things that you need to do in order to make the change aren't going to cost a whole lot. They just aren't. But we create the plan. We know where we're going. And then we can use and utilize that $500 to make the first change that is going to make the biggest impact. That biggest impact is going to sit with us for a while until we save our pennies and we can make the second change or the third and fourth. You would be amazed with how much you can actually do with $500. It's pretty remarkable and it is pretty eye-opening to the client when we say, yeah, here we go. $500. That is actually fantastic. Let's do it. We're not writing the blank check, the blank check to say, whatever you want, here we go. We're making a plan. So put the energy into making a plan, put it there. And if you're not sure how you can make a plan that works for you and that works in your budget, I want you to reach out. Creating an action plan, a design action plan that works with the budget you have, the room that you want, the timeline that you need, sometimes it requires a guide. Sometimes it requires an eye that is not necessarily living in the space, a neutral party. Sometimes it requires someone who can see the vision for you and help you know which step is first, which step is second and third and fourth and so on. Sometimes for you, getting unstuck is as simple as booking the decorating SOS call. Having that one hour Zoom conversation where you can tell the frustrations and the goals you have for the room, where you can showcase what it is you have going on and where it is you want to go, even if you don't know the end goal yourself, so that we can make a plan and design a plan for you. Sometimes it's more than just the phone call. Sometimes you want more than just the first step or the second step. Sometimes you want an action plan plan laid out for you in the form of a room edit where you send in three to five pictures and the idea of what you want your home to feel like, what you want it to look like, and you know you're motivated. You know that you are willing to paint the walls, move the furniture, buy the pillows. You know that you can hang the pictures yourself or rehang the curtains. You know that. You just need to know what to do. And that room edit allows you to have that designer's eye on your space, giving you all of the generalized recommendations for how to get where you want to go. It's more than a phone call and it's not 
full service design. It is a great option. One of my dear friends has recently done a room edit in her home and we worked on it, gosh, a year and a half ago. And she has watched and rewatched and rewatched and re-listened and asked questions about the room edit that I presented for her. And her home looks amazing. She has taken all of those design action steps and she has transformed her space one room at a time, one project at a time, one surface area at a time, one paint color at a time. And her home, what went from a lovely home, it went from that to amazing. It is bright. It is airy. It is full of her style. It is oozing from every corner. She was able to make complete transformation just from a room in it. So if you're curious what that is, if you're thinking, oh, that sounds interesting, I want you to go to figandfarmathome.com forward slash room edit. And there's a video there for you to watch. I think it's actually her room. I give an example of what a room edit is so you can get an idea that it is not product specific. I'm not picking out the couch. I'm not picking out the lights. I'm not picking out the pillows. I'm giving you a generalized idea based on what it is you want to do, what you want to achieve, what you want to feel, and then you go from there. And the transformation can be remarkable, just like it was for her. But go and watch that if you're curious what a room edit is. Maybe that's right for you. The third B, the third barrier for keeping your home from feeling and looking cohesive is borrow. And what I mean by borrow is actually plagiarize. But I had to find a B word. (laughs) But here's what I mean by that. Plagiarizing, we know, is copying pretty much word for word, thing for thing. And when you borrow or you plagiarize one image that you see somewhere inspirational, Instagram, Pinterest, HGTV, the magazines, if you take that one image and you pretty much item for item copy it in your own space, that can be a barrier to creating a cohesive looking home. Those images, no doubt, are beautiful. They absolutely are. They are absolutely beautiful. They're inspiring. And most often they work for the person that is showcasing them. It is their design style. It is their aesthetic. It is their home. And the reason it works for them is because they are so in tune with their personal design style that they're confidently making these design decisions over and over and over again. And they are able to take those design decisions from room to room to room, carrying their design style from room to room to room. Now, the problem doesn't come from you recognizing a beautiful picture. That's amazing, honestly. It's really wonderful when you can understand and appreciate what it is you like as well as what it is you don't like. That is a great first step. But when you take an an image from Pinterest, we'll say, because this is the most common one I hear, you take an image from Pinterest and you say, I am going to do absolutely that in my, insert the room, bathroom, master bedroom, living room, dining room, what have you. Listen carefully. Turn the volume up. Only a couple percent, only, only a couple percent of people actually nail it because what is happening is you are you are taking their style you're taking the thing that they worked for which is fine copying is the most sincere form of flattery we've heard that since we were two right but that style that design style that design sensibility that aesthetic whatever you want to call it isn't yours and only about two percent maybe five maybe even ten not very many Only about, we'll say 10% to be generous, get it based on what their aesthetic is. They understand what it is that they want their home and their space to feel like almost to their core. When you understand what your design aesthetic is, you can go so quickly through the aisles of Target, Home Goods, Ikea, even Home Depot, anywhere online. You can go through those aisles. Fill up your cart and you can do it efficiently. You can do it with confidence. You can do it with less overwhelm, less frustration. You can do it because you know if someone said, hey, what metals do you like? Boom, you've got it. What kind of textures do you like? Boom, you've got it. What color? Boom, you've got it. 
you've got it. You know all of the design elements, almost like you know the back of your hand. The people who are presenting themselves on Instagram, Pinterest, all of the places, they know their design style just like that. They know that when they go to Target, they can appreciate all of the pretty pillows that are pretty, but they're not them. They're not their style. They're going to gravitate towards the ones that are theirs over and over and over again. So when you borrow or plagiarize, whatever word you want to use, a a picture from Pinterest and you say, I'm going to copy it into my own home, it will be lovely and it might just be so, so, so pretty even in your home. But then what happens when we look around? Does your home look like a patchwork quilt? Does it look different one square squares being different rooms to another? Does it look like little islands being the landscape of your floor plan? Oftentimes that's what happens. Often. So I caution you to not just borrow the pictures you see on Pinterest. And I do think, you know, part of me is torn between this idea that Pinterest is not only inspirational now, it is shoppable. And I feel really torn about that. For me, I love it. I haven't used it yet. I haven't direct linked to anything so that I can purchase anything. And I haven't put any direct links from my things onto um, my pins. And I, I don't think I will. But what I have noticed is that it provides a really, really, really easy way for those of us who have that natural barrier to creating our own cohesive looking home. It makes it easier for us to plagiarize to borrow. And I don't think I like that. I don't think I like that. I think I like the idea of taking an image and appreciating what it is and seeing how can you translate that using the filter of your design style. And if you're wondering, what is she talking about? (laughs) So many of us wonder, what is Danny talking about? Even my kids wonder. So don't, you're not alone. You are not alone. Here's what I'm talking about. I recognize style being super, super global. It is incredibly global. Style are the things we see in the magazines and on Pinterest. Farmhouse is a style. Nautical is a style. Joanna Gaines is her own style. That is, I, it is a generalized global style. But aesthetic is something completely nuanced. Your aesthetic is unique to you. It is as unique to you as your fingerprints. It is as unique to you as your eye color. It is as unique to you as a cute little dimple on the corner of your cheek. It is as unique to you as you. And when we understand what our own design aesthetic is, and you can insert style if you want to, but your own style, not the big global styles. When you understand your own style, your own aesthetic, you then get out of overwhelm. You get out of overwhelm and decisions for design become a lot easier. They become a lot more manageable. They become a lot more, a lot less frustrating, a lot more enjoyable, a lot more easy. Because when you walk into Target and you stand in front of the pillow aisle, instead of standing there for what feels like hours, looking and looking and looking and picking up and touching and turning over and walking back and putting it in your cart and walking around the left, you you know this drill, right? You've done this drill. <laughs> when it doesn't become that anymore, it becomes easy. When you understand what design element about the pillow you like, what color, what texture, what pattern, what tassel, what fringe, what accessory, what adjective. When you understand that, design decisions become easier. And when they become easier for things like pillow picking, which (laughs) that sounded fun to say, pillow picking. When they become easier for pillow picking, imagine how much easier it is for picking paint colors or picking tile. Or when you can do the remodel down the road, picking tile and the countertop. Imagine. So if you're curious, if you're wondering how on earth do I understand my design aesthetic, my design style, Danny, you're saying it's unique to me. Yes, yes, it is. How do you do that? You learn it. You absolutely learn it. You dive in and you become a student of design. 
It doesn't mean that you are then going to do what I'm doing. It doesn't mean that you're then going to have clients. It doesn't mean any of that, but it become it means that you are putting on the lens that allows you to view all of these different products, all of these different big pictures like uh, living rooms, dining rooms, bedrooms. You view that through the lens of a designer. You pinpoint teeny tiny little things that help you understand the design elements that make up these pictures that you love. And if you want more, if you are wondering, yes, that sounds exactly what I need. I want it to be easy. I'm tired of doing the overwhelm. If you want more, I have a course for you. It's called Pinterest 101, Pinning with a Purpose. And it's called Pinning with a Purpose because oftentimes we find ourselves on Pinterest sitting there. It is so much fun. If I have five minutes and I'm waiting for my boys, I get on Pinterest and it's so much fun. It is a, it's a fun site to be on right? It's super encouraging. There's not a whole lot of yuck happening and it is visually inspiring. And if you think, oh gosh, I don't want a social media thing. It's not. Yes, I can have a follower. Yes, I can follow, but it is more the integrity of why you are doing that is completely different than why you would do that for Instagram or Facebook. But I teach you how to use Pinterest as a tool, how to use it purposefully as a student of design rather than as a time killer when you're trying to find a recipe when you're trying to find which couch to get when you're trying to find which how to paint your nails I teach how to become a student of design and once you understand how to use Pinterest to your advantage you then understand your aesthetic and when you understand your aesthetic you can stand in front of that pillow aisle for five minutes and get that pillow that you want that you know is going to look awesome (laughs) instead of standing there for an hour it is truly a remarkable skill to have all right friends that is it for today i hope you are inspired to look for the barriers in your space I hope you're inspired to remediate the barriers, and I hope you are inspired to take a look at how any of those ways, if you want to go further than what this podcast offers, if you want to go further than what the Facebook community offers, which by the way, please come and join. We do have lots of fun in there. I do want you to look a little deeper. Will one of these ideas help you? Will one of these areas help you get to where you want to go? I bet they will. And I bet if you took one little look, they might be more accessible than you imagine. They might be less than that pillow picking purchase. (laughs) It sounds like Sally sold seashells on the seashore. It might be more accessible than that pillow picking purchase you just had at Target that you know you're going to have to go back and return because you didn't get it quite right. So go and take a peek at figandfarmathome.com. And if you are at all curious, you think, oh, any of these options sound awesome, book a discovery call. A discovery call is a free 15 minute call where we chat a little bit about what is going on for you and maybe get a sense of which thing would be best for you so that you can reach your goals in your home. All right, friends, that's it for now. And I do want to say one more thing before I go. You might have noticed, if you are a regular listener, that Tuesday I wasn't there. I didn't show up on Tuesday. And it wasn't because I was sipping Mai Tais on the beach in Hawaii. Oh, I wish. (laughs) It wasn't because I was getting my nails done or I had something better to do. It was because I ran out of questions. I went through the list of the questions that you had sent me over the course of time, and I have no more. Tuesdays are dedicated for you, the listener, to ask your questions, to get to the bottom of what it is you want to know. And if you don't have a question, a specific question, that's okay. Maybe you have something a little bit more generalized that you want to learn about. Maybe you want to learn about thrifting. Maybe you want to learn about best places to purchase. Maybe you want to learn about the three things you might find at Ikea. I don't know. Whatever it is that you want to learn about, send me a DM on Instagram at Fig and Farm, pop into the Facebook group, or send me an email at figandfarm at home at gmail.com. That was a lot of ads. All of those links will be in the show notes. You can connect with me there, and I so love hearing from you. So make sure that you drop in to any of those spaces if you want me to answer a question or you want me to speak on a generalized topic, because 
I don't know what you don't know. I don't know what you want to learn. And I don't know in the areas that you want to grow unless you tell me. All right, friends, until next time, I hope you're well. I'll see you soon. Hey, real quick before you go, if you learned something new or found value in today's podcast, would you head over to iTunes to Fig and Farm at Home and leave a review and subscribe to the show? That would be awesome. And if you'd like to connect with my community of mamas who are learning to be intentional storytellers within their own homes, join us at bit.ly forward slash design 101 group. There's always more room at the table. See you soon.